just a very brief review of what is certainly true um, uh, about uh, uh, the notion of uh, stability. Um, stability um, minimal surfaces. Spectacular result in the history of mathematics in its proof that Bernstein's theorems were what absolutely proved it. Or a proof rather, because it's not the original proof. Um, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, is, yeah. We talk about the origins of uh, the proof that I'm going to show you um, in a little bit. So again, Bernstein's theorem is a um, you know, in, in complex function theorem, uh, theory, when you have an entire complex function that is bounded, then it's constant y. How do you prove that? An entire analytic function is constant. How do you prove that? Maximum modulus is the same. Modulus, maximum modulus is the same. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So the question is right. So the thing about uh, let me let me pick up on your proof, right? There's Cauchy's integral formula. So you know when you have a holomorphic function, uh, when you integrate it uh, along, along any closed contour, the integral gives zero. Now one thing that you can do with a holomorphic function is you can create uh, another meromorphic function simply by di dividing it by z, right? So you can take uh, a holomorphic function. Uh, F maybe I think they usually often call F F F of Z divided by Z. So there's no quite holomorphic anymore, but uh, not too far. So when you are integrating uh, uh, you know the function across you know an oriented circle with uh, center at the origin, uh, what do you get? So remember you usually divide by two pi. And what does that give you? Plus or minus one, depending on the orientation. No. No? Uh, yeah, zero. Right. It gives you the value of the function at the origin. Oh. It picks up the residue, which is the value of the function at the origin. So, uh, so when you have a, a holomorphic function, uh, you know, the value at the origin is equal to the integral of h of z divided by z, you know, up to a factor, a constant factor. So, uh, if now h is a, a bounded function, it seems like can get this straight. Um, so also holomorphic functions that are relative side gain holomorphic, right? So you can actually iterate uh, this. So you can uh, uh, yeah. So let's see how does the proof work. Then? So when you take your holomorphic function in, uh, you know. So when you say the value of the holomorphic so now it just arrived. So it's probably not seen by the camera or maybe it's so uh, it's it's barely H, not. H of zero is vulnerable to pi i. Uh, the integral, you know, gamma where gamma uh, it could be any closed curve. Now y goes counterclockwise uh, across the origin of H of Z uh, divided by Z. So one thing that you can observe is when you take you know, when you when you look at this expression, right? When you evaluate, uh, you know, one thing that you can do is you can do h of zero if you know if you want over two pi uh, times mm. the maximum of h of z uh, z e. So that you know gamma p like s r, which is the grid. So uh, one over two pi. So the maximum of uh, h of z, so z, the modulus of z is constant uh, around such curves, is constant and equal to r. So it's the maximum of the value of h of z divided by r. And uh, 1 over 2 pi i, right, when we're integrating, we, we still have to multiply by the length of this, uh, this curve gamma. So that would be 2 pi r. 2 pi 
the two piles cancel, right? So what is left is actually multiplication in the power. So that, I guess, would be your next homogeneous principle that the value of the function of the origin uh, can be, uh, uh, you know, is bounded by the value of the function on the boundary of the NAR, uh, of the NAR uh, disk. And uh, so you can actually mm -hmm. derive the statement from there if you take one derivative higher. So, you know, so <laughs> and actually there's good preparation for what I'm going to show you about the modern function of universe, completely plotting this in all our complex function theory so much. <laughs> but I actually have looked at this for, for I don't even know if you were born then. Probably not, as a matter of fact. It's a uh, no, no offense. But I was good math then <laughs> too. Uh, this is very classical. So you can iterate this argument, right? You can actually apply it to the derivative of the uh, holomorphic function. And actually, what you can get it, you can get it uh, 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 an absolute estimate of the derivative of a holomorphic function of any any degree at a given point by uh, the maximum of the function. Of if you only think about units, the k, uh, a, a derivative of order, holomorphic derivative of order k here must correspond to an estimate of the form where k is of some constant. If there's such a constant estimate at all, uh, the, 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 the same maximum divided uh, by the order of the derivative. Mm -hmm. So now, if this is bounded, right, radius to the power of the derivative of this, and if this is bounded by absolute values, then you uh, you know that the derivative of the function, so, so there's an estimate that follows analogous and analogously of this form. So there's a, a constant here, so there's the same maximum modulus, say in SR, um, uh, divided by R. So derivative of first order R to the power of n. So if you, if you say you have a bounded holomorphic function, Right, this is a constant. Right, this is this is bounded no matter how large R is. I want to say. Right, this will imply that the derivative uh, at the origin uh, is a uh, uh, is a uh, is this here from? No, it's flips. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Max, this is a uh, you know I like here from too, but Max is uh, Max is here. <laughs> discussion was for harmonic functions, actually in any dimension. Right, we might mention two harmonic functions and monomorphic functions very closely related. Right? Every harmonic function has a harmonic conjugate, right, and when you look at harmonic function plus i times its harmonic conjugate, you have a monomorphic function, and you can play these tricks. Um, no, not tricks, beautiful mathematics. And I've also, you know, this is a, a more or less a cliche, but a, a but you know, a cliche that can be built into 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 uh, actual mathematics that uh, minimal surfaces or the minimal surface equation is the geometric analog of the uh, the Laplace equation. The equation, you know, Laplace should not u is equal to zero. That you know, that, you know, when this holds, then the function is homogeneous. And uh, so, in in a way, this first theorem is uh, now a geometric and exact geometric analog. Uh, so we can just write down, so if you have a function u uh, from r, so a function u, uh, let's say c infinity, you know, a smooth function u on r2, such that the minimal surface equation is the minimal surface equation of the diversions of the Laplacian of u divided by one is equal to u squared is equal to zero. Uh, so this is the minimal surface equation in uh, This Bergson theorem, we're going to prove it. Actually, the proof in many ways is going to be the same as what they proved, but it was a huge question. And the last thing I want to like to continue with uh, you know, filling you in on some theory uh, on the So, the last thing I want to 
the first I, I like to think today about is this review of stability of the universe. So, uh, and it's a review, so I'm reviewing the bits that are relevant for uh, the continuation of the class. And uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll give you in writing what I hope to be, you know, is something more general. And TM is going to keep my science uh, <laughs> uh, in order. So, um, so we call. So this is something we've already made on the, on the board in, in some way, but we can try and uh, put this together now. So uh, suppose that sigma in R is uh, is a uh, be a compact uh, um, R in hypersurface. I need to pick an orientation, um, you know, that's equivalent to, uh, to having a unit normal field uh, and an orientation. So uh, suppose uh, this uh, surface, this uh, surface has the following property. of sigma, so this is redundant, now I'm getting scaled up from the rest, so sigma mod is equal to sigma, uh, and uh, uh, in such that the boundary of sigma t, so you know, compact, compact is different from closed, right? Closed means compact, no manifold boundary, now I'm talking about uh, hypersurfaces that in general will have boundary. Uh, the boundary of sigma t is equal to you know, the boundary of uh, this uh, surface to be having from sigma for all Surfaces to keep the boundary fixed. Sigma is the, uh, the, the surface of least area in the scale. Mm -hmm. So this is you know, the property of a you know, in area minimizer. So maybe let's call it, call it this. Maybe let's call it Uh, 
uh, and it translates to the following. And, uh, if you, if this is now the tangential gradient of f, right? f is a function of sigma small, and it's uh, uh, this is the you know if you only have it on sigma, <laughs> you can't compute any other grade. Well, it's unreasonable, but mm. uh, you know this is the tangential gradient of the intrinsic gradient of f. It's bigger than So, and uh, also observe and recall what is this, uh, this quantity here? This is the sum of principal um, quadratures. So, we made by you know, the end result. Trace of A transpose A by A is the matrix formed from the components. This matrix here. So, anyway, let me just, uh, you know, since I also make a patient skin, maybe I think it's a word and I think it's free, but maybe somebody wants to check, maybe Leon, uh, uh, calling this. Uh, Review or recall, uh, let me also remind you of where this comes from, right? Why is this a thing, right? This is a ostentatious remark of why, why this is true. So, uh, uh, if you fix uh, an A and C infinity of sigma uh, with uh, A uh, is equal to zero. Consider for uh, a sign with a zero sufficiently small small uh, variation sigma t in case of the sign where sigma. Has to be zero. This has to be zero, right? Uh, because uh, um, you know t is equal to zero is a critical point for area in all these variations. It's actually a stable critical point. So this, because you can do this for every t and uh, for every such function f, and because you can compute this derivative also explicitly using the first variation of uh, area formula. Uh, you see that this implies that uh, this implies uh, yeah, this implies that it's just equal to zero. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, uh, the fact that t squared by the t squared uh, at t is equal to zero of area of uh, sigma t, so this must be big or equal. Because it's uh, not just a critical point; it's actually a point of, uh, uh, you know, it's a it's a global minimum. So the second derivative has to be, uh, you know, it can't be concave. <laughs> Yeah, this 
this is a, this is a, so this means that uh, uh, <coughs> so one means that uh, one means that sigma is a minimal surface. Don't ask me why I changed to green. are local with respect to sigma. That's a little hard to explain, but uh, there are surfaces sigma that satisfy these properties but don't have this property. Right? Not every... So this makes you warm and, and comfy, right? Infinitesimally, you feel you could be, but you're not necessary. So there are stable minimal surfaces that are Uh, you know, you have it filled in, but it's actually not the area. You know, you see. Let me not get into this. <laughs> I start experimenting with my there. Yes, because I forgot all my equipment and Thomas is not here to describe his experiments or uh, can only uh, go. So now let's talk about the proof. So let's let's go back to this to the minimal surface equation. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about uh, this theorem uh, of Zerbeck uh, uh, first. So proof. Surface, and we've already seen this, and remember this was this beautiful uh, application of the divergence theorem where we took the unit normal uh, corresponding to this graph and considered it uh, a vector field on the, not, not, uh, not, not, on, not only along the surface, but actually you know, by parallel translation uh, on all of R3 references in R3, you know, observing that. Vector field on R3 is divergence free. Yeah. And then applying the divergence field, so this is something which you do in general relativity, also all the time, right? Maybe non trivial divergence free vector fields, you know, they, they correspond to conserved, or, well, conserved, they correspond to objects of maybe another philosophy. Uh, it's something I should not get into, but it's, it, it's a great to have divergence free. You can use them to show this particular, this particular instance uh, to show that sigma is actually area minimizing. Uh, and you know, this sigma has no boundary, it's not compact, in, in what sense is it area minimizing? Uh, so then sigma intersected with dr0 uh, uh, is uh, area minimizing
think that the intersection there into which uh, this intersection is transverse. <laughs> for almost every so when you when you have a um, okay so when I have this is a good example <laughs> um, so the origin is uh, in the middle of the axis of the cylinder You can push it on the window, it's okay. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, when I'm expanding a sphere from radius, you know, uh, from the point to a larger sphere, so this is, imagine this is Lama's surface and there's clearly not a graph. But, uh, you know, you know uh, until the radius is equal to the radius of the cross section of the cylinder, there's no intersection at all. Then, <coughs> when it is equal to the radius of the cross section, this is a non transverse intersection. So uh, then when you're expanding, oh god, I'm sorry. Um, yes, and then when you're expanding the, even further, you have a transverse intersection. So what does transverse intersection mean? Uh, so when two surfaces intersect, at, at a point where two surfaces intersect, I can ask myself the question whether at, at that point the tangent spaces together span the entire Indian space or the plane. Right? And when they span the entire Indian space together, it turns out this intersection is transverse in the sense that the intersection is actually a, a submanifold. Right? This is why this example is terrible, <laughs> because you know, it would also at the point of transverse intersection have, you know, but it's an accident because I chose my example very poorly. Take uh, a plane. You know, suppose I have a family of expanding spheres, right? No intersection, no intersection, no intersection. And then there's this, this exceptional point, right? And then, you know, it's circles, 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 right? And at this exceptional point, right? Mm -hmm. Why are you laughing? It's a good test. <laughs> 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 Line might, this horizontal line might just be an, would just be an exception to it because 
you know, if you change its height, right? If you look at other horizontal uh, lines, almost every one of them needs to intersect. That's the uh, transfer space when you intersect. All you, what you get is a linear log form. And you, you can do this, you know, also in higher dimension. I mean, linear log isolated form. I mean, every who isn't a linear log form? But uh, <laughs> well, the empty set, I guess. Um, I can, uh, technically, I think that's the empty. You know, there, there are also some fields where you really have to worry about these things because if you, if you don't pay attention, like your whole theorem might be vacuous. Um, so, but uh, Sartre's theorem is this true. Okay. Um, is your PR zero a closed or open door? PR zero is always open. Open question. So for open. So then the interfacement should be the intersection with the boundary series kind of because the intersection with the board always changes. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Super. because you've asked me about this type of mathematics, so I, I really do need to give uh, this uh, 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 name uh, for that. Uh, so that's very much in MIT text, and Victor Gilman was, uh, his office is, was opposite from mine when I was, was working in MIT, and I, I liked him very much, and uh, also uh, Victor helped me this, you know, realize that you can hear that you can, how easy it is to distinguish people by how they walk if you pay only a little attention. So with Gilliman, you don't need any attention at all. Because <laughs> the way he walks, he walks in short little spurts, short little excited spurts. And that's really, really easy. But uh, yeah, I'm very fond of him. And it's a very beautiful text. And I think it's also available for free, uh, free online. Um, so this is true. So, and then there's something that we've already uh, done with this fact that are, you know, uh, the graphs of minimal functions, uh, of, of the graphs of uh, uh, functions satisfying the minimal circular equation are, uh, are minimizing when they are, uh, we show they are, um, so um, um, uh, first we show the graph step, uh, we show that uh, the area uh, of sigma uh, intersected with R0 is less than or equal to um, uh, 2 pi r squared. And this 2 pi r squared, you know, just to recall uh, the argument, is um, half of 4 pi r squared. So the idea is that when you have uh, one of these, uh, these minimal graphs, right, and you, you intersect uh, with a uh, Is that you know this is a uh, you know sigma is a uh, is a uh, area minimizing uh, in this in this ball so you know and imagine this is a transverse intersection it's you know you know it is uh, it is you know uh, apparent in from how I sketched it what I, what I mean here uh, then you know um, so this is a would be a a, a complex manifold with boundary right and it's set well. In this picture, it would separate uh, the sphere of radius R1 uh, into two submanifolds. Could be, they could really be disconnected in my picture, they are not. In uh, the area, so this, the area of sigma in here, is less than or equal to that area, and it's also less than or equal to that area, right? because it's area minimizing, and they all have the same boundary. And one of these two submanifolds is area less than or equal half the total. Which is for my R1. So this is where this comes from, this area is there. And the other thing uh, that we that we know is uh, from stability. So uh, the other consequence from being area minimizing because you are a minimal graph is stability that the area, not the area, is is this. This is for all f that are compared. 
take this order uh, in sigma. Observe something. So this is a moving degree mass. If we could use the function a, <laughs> which is plainly not compactly supported, that is constantly equal to one is uh, in the product here. Just thought experiment. Suppose we could plug in the function that's everywhere equal to one. Well, this would be zero, right? Because constant functions they don't have much gradient. <laughs> in fact, they have dashing gradient. Zero. So then, you know, if we on the left, on the right hand side, we would have uh, the integral of h squared again times n. So zero less than or equal the integral over the patently non negative quantity. That in the quality would imply that the uh, said non negative quantity is everywhere equal to zero. So that would mean h is equal to zero if every time you take omega to zero, and you already know that in the second time you take omega h is in. Uh, the surface itself is a union, is contained in a union of integrity. Yeah, because it's connected, it would be a logical argument, it would be you know, in a hypothesis. Form and So now we can't, that means we can't put in f is equal to one, but it turns out we can get very close. In, in fact, by using what is called a logarithmic calorific, uh, something that Leon Simon refers to as bread and butter or mother milk. Uh, he has lots of very, uh, I think he grew up on a farm in Australia, uh, in Athens. <laughs> lots of you know, expressions that, uh, that go like this. So you should all know the logarithmic cutoff trick. Uh, it was going to use it to show that even though you can't plug in the function that is constantly equal to 1, you, know, you can use functions that approximate this well enough so that the conclusion is still uh, the same. Uh, and in fact, exactly what we need. So let me, uh, let me actually try drawing this thing. This part. So, then when we talk about harmonic functions, this you know, choice uh, that I'm going to confront you with uh, in just a moment of, of so test functions, you know, functions f that you test this inequality with. Uh, this is where this comes from. So, uh, so, uh, so what we are doing, uh, so what to do, uh, this is we are. So maybe just let me just move. So uh, let's fix zero less than R less than capital R. Uh, two real numbers, one bigger than the other, both positive. Uh, and uh, and uh, I would like to test uh, uh, I'm going to use uh, uh, a test function. Subscript for approximation. If R R, use this smoothly uh, approximate. Of x is before x of r, and in between a times. 
Lipschitz function, so this function to have any chance, so I'm connecting one on uh, the ball of radius, sigma is the ball of radius r, so this should be the function on sigma. But, uh, you know, if you are, uh, you might be a little bit uncomfortable with these functions on sigma, you can also think of this as being a function on all of R3, and then it's restricted to sigma. Mm -hmm. Let me get back to this. So uh, I, I say I want a Lipschitz function, or rather I would approximate a function, like the approximate function of uh, the Lipschitz function. Uh, so where A and B Chosen uh, to make uh, this continuous. So I E. So we needed to connect uh, continuously to one when the modulus of X is equal to uh, uh, the lowercase R. So A plus B times the logarithm of R. Continuously uh, to zero uh, when the modulus uh, of, of x is equal to capital R. So when you think about this, uh, no, this is a this is a, somehow a freebie, <laughs> but you can always when because uh, lowercase r and capital R are not the same. You can uh, emit the logarithms are, uh, are different. You can always there's a unique solution to this. Always, and actually, I'm only interested in the value of b. Right? So, the value of b uh, I can obtain by subtracting these two equations. So, it's b times logarithm of lowercase r divided by uh, capital of r because this is how logarithms work. So, that's equal to 1. So, you can divide out. So, this is 1 divided. Such case functions, and when I say smoothly approximate, it needs to somehow. So this is not that. This is only a Lipschitz function, right? I mean, the way these functions look like, uh, you know, as a, as a function of uh, uh, the modulus is one, zero, and then it's a, a logarithmic function in between. So you know, it's certainly not C one with these two points. And I guess to say smoothly approximate. Use so it's because it's wrong, smooth test functions that uh, in B zero one. <laughs> so as Lipschitz functions. Important thing is that the inequality is continuous. You see, if this if you know this inequality holds for all smooth functions, then you also know that if it holds for all functions that can be approximated by compactness to the smooth function, such that the left hand side and the right hand side behave continuously in this approximation. In a, on the left hand side, you have right. So there's this friction in derivatives that you have. So you can certainly not approximate in C1, uh, but you can approximate. So this is maybe also uh, that in, <laughs> I know, that appropriately. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not funny for learners. <laughs> so if you can't explain what appropriately means in this context, this will be an instant fail on my exam. I'm I'm really kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is quite fun. This, this reminds me of yeah. Do you think so, of C01 doesn't work? <clears throat> well, it's a question of what does it actually mean? 
Mm-hmm. It's a bad, it's actually a bad idea, I, I claim. Please let me not go off on this thing, mm-hmm. but thank you. So, on that, yeah, it's, what I need is that the left hand side and the right hand side will move continuously in this approximation. So for the right hand side, all you need is, you know, L2 approximate. This is, uh, this is bounded. And on the left hand side it would be so you know if you want uh, okay so I tell you what the answer is so uh, certainly H1 would be enough if you know what H1 is then why not use H1 but the important thing is it's possible to obtain by this approximation argument this inequality where you may pretend f is exactly this function. Even though this function is not smooth, so complex so called, but you by approximation you can get the result that you that you would get by evaluating left and right hand side by exactly uh, that function um, just as well. So what does this uh, what does this give us? Uh, so it means there are stars. So uh, the, in, uh, the integral uh, <laughs> So let me call this function here. something to refer to capital F. So uh, uh, so notice uh, this the, the right hand side is certainly equal equal than the integral of the h square on the ball of radius r. Sigma, sigma intersects with the ball of radius lower case r. Right? Because you know the function capital F is one on the ball, the rest is non-negative, so you can estimate the right hand side by this. And for the right hand side, notice that this is bigger equal than uh, the integral over sigma intersected B R. So they're always saying that they're the origin. I won't uh, you know, I won't uh, I won't B R uh, all. So when we are computing the gradient, so if it's actually you know if I, I use the function of sigma, but it's a perfectly good function of all of our three. So I can view it as a function of all of our three that I'm restricting to sigma. These are useful things to know about gradients. So when you have a function that you restrict to a submanifold, its full gradient in ambient space dominates and its gradient and its gradient along the submanifold are related by one being the tangential projection of the other. So in particular the length of this uh, uh, the gradient of this function ambiently is great bigger or equal than the length of the, the gradient of uh, this function when you uh, restrict it to a submanifold. So when you think about the gradient of this function, well, it's zero when the modulus is less than lowercase r, zero when the modulus is uh, uh, bigger or equal than uh, uh, capital of r, and the gradient in between is b times, is b, the tangential gradient is bigger than b times one over the modulus of x. Because the gradient of the, the ambient gradient is b times oh, you know, uh, one over r times uh, the unit position. If you like. So this is one over b squared, one over x squared. So and now. It turns out that it's uh, so you know when you 
somehow, when you're beginning to suspect that the logarithmic cutoff trick could be useful, so the point is that this is. So if you remember, uh, 1 over um, x squared, this integral, what is it equal to? Let's say this in a. Uh, you go to polar coordinates, right? This is integral of one to infinity, one over r squared, times the area element in polar coordinates would be r, right? And then there's also a times two pi gets from integrating out uh, the angle, right? And this integral here is a uh, one over r squared times r, the integrand, this is one over r, so actually this is infinity, right? But it's some of the logarithm of infinity. Now it turns out the logarithm, <laughs> yes, diverges, but <laughs> very slowly. And it turns out that you can that you can uh, compensate with this one over v squared thing. So uh, sorry, mm -hmm. why is it one, one over v squared again? Why is it not just v squared? It's a good question. Thanks for asking. Um, so what I'm doing now is I'm uh, this capital R I'm going to choose of the form 2 to the power of n times r where n is equal to 1, 2, and so forth. Okay, just make the special choice. And then notice, so I'm going to do a preliminary estimate just to see, to show where, where this is going and then we are going to refine it. So the integral of 1 over x squared v sigma on v r minus v r. This is certainly no more than the area of sigma in v capital R, which is no more than 2 pi capital R squared, times you know, the, the largest value on this domain uh, of the integrand, which is 1 over lower x. So it would be 2 pi r, capital R divided by lower x r. So now it turns out that something more refined is appropriate here. So uh, uh, it's called for here. Yeah. argument as before is less than or equal to. So here the area of sigma in the larger form, this would be 2 pi times 2r squared at most, times the largest value, and this is where you gain, uh, on the integrand on this domain, which would be 1 over r squared. And if you think about it, <laughs> You know, that's the first sum, and so this would be, a, I guess, 8 pi. The second sum, if you do this, run the same estimate of the second sum, it's exactly the same. It's built the same way, it scales the same. So, I'm going to scale in very complicated, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, the second sum would also be. So 
This means um, B squared. So in our case, B squared uh, sigma intersected B totally in R minus B R. So let me pick up the very first term from here. So let me start by picking up this term. So the integral sigma intersected b lower x r of formula x squared is less than or equal. So now we have b squared. If you remember, b was 1 over logarithm lowercase r divided by capital R. Uh, so this would be 1 divided by theta k n squared, right? Lowercase r divided by capital R, and capital R is r, lowercase r times 2 to the n, oh, this is not right. Um, almost hooked me there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, mm -hmm, of course. Uh, and then, uh, no, I'm sorry, I wanted to say this. So this tends to zero uh, is in tends to infinity. It always stops in us. Okay. So this means, you know, let's celebrate this conclusion that uh, uh, that uh, If you recall, uh, HIJ So, you know, uh, if the second fundamental cone vanishes, then the Hessian of U is zero, so the gradient of U doesn't, is constant. So, the function is inside a linear function. So, this is first. It must somehow be, maybe, maybe he's not the first person to, to come up with this proof, but I know this from my time as a PhD student when you need uh, some ideas that you know, people, not one, but somehow everyone around that are aware of this. It might have been Andre who was the first to, to write this up. It was, I don't think it was earlier than 1960, 
da da in, in, in allem ganz bitter das Argument bei der Geschenkung war, es ist definitiv in Ordnung, wie kommt es hin. So, So we have, I mean, it's, you know, for your general education, but we also need it now when we are uh, taking the Dagi Sarum solution of the Sarum problem. Uh, so we talk a little bit about the model functions. See, when I'm writing you these other jokes, It's really snap writing a little bit this thing, but other people might think it's funny. I think other people are funnier sometimes. Not the whole, to be honest. Uh, so, uh, so this is, again, this is for now, this is a class. This is your vanilla La Paz operator. In the, in the, if, um, uh, we say that uh, u is equal to u is harmonic if this is the class of operators in the uh, So, and actually, let me, I will usually denote the many functions by h now. Uh, on so, there's a a beautiful property of all harmonic functions we have, and they somehow they correspond to the Cauchy formula. So it's a mean line property. And, um, so suppose I have a smooth function. Uh, it is a yeah, smooth function of C2 puts me in half. Let me just let's go with the C2 function. So it turns out every harmonic function is actually automatically a smooth function. But privacy is we will see in a moment. Suppose that the ball of the is uh, row center the x is contained completely uh, in the domain u. Uh, 
are the same, it is true that h or x, the value of the function h, same for the uh, the point x, is equal to the average of the function on the ball of radius rho with the same center, and also equal to the average of uh, the sphere of radius rho. This is called the mean value of the thing. In uh, uh, last thing for this, uh, the proof. So also using this is uh, an opportunity to remind you uh, of a few things. So we can easily reduce to the case where x is equal to zero. If you have a harmonic function, all its translates are harmonic. So actually, also this is something good for you to check. That, you know, if you Recompose a harmonic function with the translation if it remains harmonic, and also when you all the Euclidean symmetries, also the rotations, it remains harmonic. So this is useful. And also rescalings. Also, you know, right? Also homothetic rescalings preserve harmonicity. We can uh, reduce um, uh, to this case uh, and then note. That uh, uh, the function which sends uh, a positive number sigma uh, 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 less than or equal rho uh, to sigma 1 minus to the power 1 minus n times uh, hmm. So sigma to the power one minus n times uh, s s sigma of x of h. If you notice, this is equal to uh, the average. Just how integration is defined. You know the difference between the area elements of S one and S sigma. You know when you're along, you know the homothetic uh, identification. The, the scaling is sigma to the one minus n to the power sigma one minus n. You know this is a constant to integration on this sphere, so you can pull it out. And this is wrong. What's missing? constant which I can read so this you know average here is a constant you know and somehow what is missing here is divided by the area of the unit sphere so I want to show this is constant so I show the derivative the derivative of this quantity with respect to sigma is zero so p by p sigma of the integral h sigma y y from s1 this is equal to if you think about it, the integral uh, is one, and this would actually be exactly uh, this would actually be exactly y times the gradient uh, of h and sigma y. This is just how you have So the p by the sigma can move inside, and then you're differentiating this. Uh, you know, it's a precomposition of multivariable functions. This is exactly what you do. So, and now this is something I can apply the divergence theorem to. So let me maybe you know one over the area of S. If I apply uh, the divergence theorem to this, and 
this is wrong over the area of S1. S1. So divergent theorem, see, this is the unit normal with respect to S1. Y from S1. So this is the unit normal plotted against the vector field, which happens to be the gradient of the harmonic temperature. So this is equal to, by the divergence theorem, the integral over the ball of radius 1, the integral over the ball of radius uh, 1 of the divergence of the gradient of, uh, so this is the divergence of the gradient of sigma evaluated at sigma y, uh, and I guess technically there is uh, a sigma moving up. But the divergence of the gradient of h, this is exactly the Laplacian of h, which is zero. So this is the Laplacian of h uh, at sigma y, this is equal to zero. So this derivative is equal to zero. Um, of a continuous function and you know over smaller and smaller domains that you know they can make smaller 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 to the limit the value of the function that is one and now this one piece of the argument that is still missing uh, So note that uh, when I'm looking at uh, uh, this uh, integral here, this is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is one over omega m uh, rho to the m of the integral zero uh, rho integral s rho h d sigma. is the same as this average, right? Uh, so, but I have to multiply this thing somehow. Uh, and how do I do this? Uh, zero rho uh, by, you know, uh, so this is a uh, um, rho m divided by m sigma to the m minus one. So, and now I can take the average. Now I can put the average there. Sorry. <laughs> uh, now I can put the average there. So this we know is constant. I think this is the value of the function. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is equal to, well, this is just equal to h of sigma. Let's face it. <laughs> OK, so I have to run off. And I thank you very much for class. Really, thank you. Somebody please turn this. I would be very grateful if somebody could take everything big to lecture here uh, to my office. Marcus is up there.